Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today, I have with me a very special guest, Phil Faluccia. Phil, can you say hi to our guest? Hey, everyone. Hope you're all doing really well. Do you know what? It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm delighted to have you here, Phil. Thank you so much for being on the show today. So I'm going to tell our audience a little bit about you. So mm. Phil Lucha, host of Billionaires and Boxers and founder of BIB. So Bib Media? Bib Media. Bib Media. A business consultant known to many as The Fixer and to others as Teddy due to surname meaning. The yeah. right hand man for broadcasting, coaching, recruitment and branding to some of the most successful businesses in tech from startups to Fortune 500 organizations. As a business mission statement, Bill introduces people with amazing skills and potential to amazingly talented people with the potential to unlock anything. So Phil, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So, and I thank you also for the the time difference that we're having because mm. you are joining us today from the UK and I am in Atlanta. So this is one of the reasons why I love podcasting so much. It brings uh, people who are so far away, right in the same space in a second to have mm. wonderful, meaningful conversations. Absolutely. Well, in fact, I'm supposed to be even further away. I'm supposed to be in Cape Town, but I got stuck in the UK due to the, the lockdown. Oh um, so just trying to make, make, a, make a plan and make do whilst here. But do you know what? We're getting into summer, so it could be worse. It could be. It could be. So I'm, I'm, but I understand you. I'm grateful, though, that, that we do get to be where we are, even though we all had other plans, right? Absolutely. But you know what? There's a reason for this. And I, and I know it sounds like such a strange thing to say, but there is genuinely a reason for all of this. I felt like we all needed to stop, reset, take stock. I mean, how many of us have put things off that we wanted to do because we didn't have the time? Well, now there's no excuse because you've got nothing but time. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100% on that. I, I tell my my friends in particular um, when they're kind of, you know, feeling in a rut and, and, you know, going through this, oh, you know, why me? Why this? Why that? And I mm -hmm. think, you know, that's never been my approach to it. Of course, you know, we had plans and those plans have to be reshifted. But I see this, this period, this evolution that we're going through together mm -hmm. as just a time for growth, development, and, and an opportunity to broaden our horizons and for me, I delved more into my podcasting, into my webinars. And so, you know, it gave me a chance to really just dive deep. But at the same time, you're, you know, if you're with your families as I am, mm. you know, you, you actually have time to dedicate to, you know, your kid's education and then you spend mm -hmm. more time with your spouse. And I mean, that in a whole day can be a lot, but mm. it shows us what we're capable of doing. I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and for me personally, this period, you know, I've, I've spent uh, the last week, at least, if not the last 10 days on the phone to just the most amazing people every single day. And I include you in that. And I'm, I'm meeting some incredible people from around the world that, that I can be inspired by and empowered by and, and hopefully do the same for others. So it, I'm loving this period. I mean, if anything, people now have more time to stop and talk and some incredible things come out of, but you know, you put two amazing people in a room together and amazing things are going to happen. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. too often we don't have time to go into a room together. And as I say, now we have time. Yes. Now I can't wait to see that. what comes from this. 
Indeed, indeed. And I dare say, you know, for those that can, because, you know, with the world being an equitable place as it is, right? Yep. The question is, is with, for those that can, like you and I, I, I feel like this is a way for us to not only show allyship, but extend a privilege that yes. somebody else might not have. So somebody 100%. else may not have time to record, but they can have time to listen and engage their intellect, right? Mm, and I 100%. Think this, this is one of the reasons why I love having a podcast. And, and I say all the time, um, at first it was, you know, to just expand my horizons, to expand my networks. And it's become, you know, it started as something where I wanted to help educate others, but really it was about educating myself and yeah. meeting other people and just learning more about the world in which I'm a part of, you know? Mm-hmm. So I always say live locally, think globally. Yes. Right? And you and I have talked off air about just our experiences in the world. And yes. that was, that I think could have been another podcast episode because, <laughs> you know, what I think what should have been like a call that lasted for a few minutes ended up being this wonderful conversation. And it I was really like, was. I need this guy on the show. <laughs> so No, I, it really I, was. I, I felt the same. And, and, and you know, it's, I love it when things like that happen. A 15 minute conversation turns into 90 really exciting minutes. And totally. Uh, that you know that's that's what these things are all about right that's that's what makes this so special and you know a good friend and and, and mentor of mine said to me recently he said you need to learn how to talk to different people so you're talking about coming from a coming from a place of privilege and I'm not sure about your background but I certainly didn't start off that way um (laughs) no you had a very very poor kid mentality that was and I think that's fair to say I was that was my environment and I was far more statistically likely to go to prison than I was to be where I am today and the thing really resonated with me is that he summed it up perfectly so I'll tell you what he said he Mm -hmm. said when you've earned more than 50 million dollars you don't do things for money anymore Mm. And he said, so when somebody comes to you and pitches this great money making idea, unless it has a really powerful reason behind it, yeah, I don't care. Like I have my own journey that I'm on. I have things that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. If your goals align with mine, we'll do business together and money will happen as a result. But I don't look at the money. That is powerful. That is powerful. And I dare say, though, I know that, you know, for those of us that are not 50 millionaires, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, that's, that's something that we're like, oh, well, let's get to that 50 first and then we'll do that. But I really think that when we do this now, yes. right, when we start to just align ourselves with people and, and just opportunities for growth and development that are in line with who we are and what our values actually are, mm-hmm. you know, I think that leads to some extraordinary conversation. But, and but means- I think that's what people yeah. need to realize is that, that it's the chicken and egg situation in a lot of people's mind. But for me, it's much clearer. You, you don't get to 50 million and then suddenly start becoming this really nice, healthy, successful right. person that now goes to the gym. It, it doesn't happen that way. You imagine wealth as something that just magnifies exactly what you are. So if you're a, a risky person, you're going to take bigger risks. If you're a a very reserved person, you're not going to suddenly become the life and soul of the party. That's, that's, it doesn't change who you are. It just magnifies who you are. And that's, that's one of the things that I love about, you know, the people that I get to work with is that, you know, there's some of the, the, the leading personal development coaches worldwide. And the one thing that they all share is this vision that they have. It doesn't have to be the same vision, but they all have one. They all know where they're going. They all have a big goal. Um, which is why I think we resonate so well together because although you know they're mu- I'd say they're much further down the road of development than I am, mm-hmm. um, but my goal is to empower a million, uh, sorry, a billion people globally I in my it. lifetime. So I want a I billion it. people. And the way we're going to do that is not through, you know, Phil Paluccia being some expert that's telling people all this stuff. Not at all. You know, we, I'm growing the, the world's largest entrepreneur broadcasting network. And it's essentially going to be bringing together the best minds, the most creative coaches, the most inspirational thought leaders, all onto one network that can be watched anywhere globally by entrepreneurs and solopreneurs so that they don't have to go through the pain that I went through. So they don't have to go through the pain that so many of us went through because it's that old adage of standing on the shoulders of giants. So my gift is not Phil Paluccia talking. That's, that's not a gift. My gift is bringing in all of these amazing people and helping them to share actionable advice with our audiences. And that's how we're going to inspire a billion people. Phil, you've got to get out of my brain because I, and this is why I felt like we were kindred spirits when we first started to have a conversation because I always used to describe myself not as the actress on stage, but as the lighting director because my gift is to help people shine. And Mm -hmm. And even beyond being my gift, it's my sincere joy. Yeah, like really, passion, right? 
Yeah, I really do love that. And it's it challenges me to bring my best self to the game each time, mm. right? And Agreed. so one of the things I had, I had said to um, a colleague, and it's it's so funny how um, business colleagues have become friends. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate to have that experience many, many times. And when they came to me because they had a problem or they needed something solved, I loved being that person because yeah. in my mind, I had a plan for them, uniquely them, and I couldn't wait to do that for them. I 100% agree. But yeah. you know what? It's like this thing. So I was, I was listening to um, one of the Bob Proctor things the other day, and he said, People often say that change is difficult. He said, change isn't difficult. Change is the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. To be changed is difficult. Oh, Some, no. Somebody else trying to change you is what's difficult. You waking up one day and somebody saying, you need to change. Mm-hmm. You're going to resist that. Yeah. But the moment that you wake up and say, I'm going to change, you are going to change. There is exactly. no two ways about it. If you make that decision, it is done. So he's right. Change change is easy once you, you know if it's that's what you want to do. And I agree. So look, great example with this. So I, I look, I thoroughly enjoy being on your podcast because I always enjoy our conversations anyway. But I am probably more so looking forward. In fact, not probably. I am more so looking forward to us recording tomorrow when you're on my show <laughs> and I get to pick your brains a lot more. So oh my gosh! But that's because that's my gift. That's what I do. My my I have the most sincere pleasure of interviewing the most incredible people. And, and hearing their stories and hearing their advice and learning from them, and, you know, some of them have, have become my mentors and I, and I never could have dreamt of being mentored by people like this. It's, it's a dream come true. Mm-hmm. And all of this is because, you know, I, I'm not going there saying, hey, please, can you just give me this stuff and don't tell anybody else that secret? Just tell right, me, right. you know, I'm, I'm very honestly and openly going on the TV network, which maybe isn't such a great idea. I think it is. And saying, I don't know either, you know, I'm, I'm right. trying to figure this stuff out just the same as you. So let's go and turn to these guys because they seem to get, have their act together. So let's start with them. I love it. I love it. I think it's fantastic. And that's going to lead us into, that's going to segue into our, our question, really. Um, the mm. first one is to tell us a bit about your professional background and your company. So tell us a bit about Billionaires and Boxers and Bim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Billionaires in Boxers was a concept. It was a joke originally, actually. Oh my gosh. Um, so it was originally a joke. So uh, myself and my business partner were working together. He's my business development director. He's based in South Africa. Uh, we were doing a radio show. It was very successful and we were going to be taking it onto TV. And we said, we were sat in this broadcast meeting one day, literally via Zoom. And somebody said, what, do we, what are we going to call the show? We still don't have a name for it. And my, my co-host, Justin, went, Phil, tell them the name you came up with the other day. And I was like, I don't remember coming up with a name the other day. He's like, yeah, you do. He said, I texted you and said, what should the name be? You came back with a smart ass reply. <laughs> and, and then we moved on. I was like, oh, billionaires in boxes. And he said, why, why would you call it billionaires in boxes? I said, because we're growing our global empire from home when I rarely put on pants to do a meeting. Oh, I love it. Um, <laughs> and everyone just went, okay, it works. We love it so much. Let's just, let's just build everything from there. So, so Bib Media is actually billionaires in boxes media. Oh my um, God, I just realized that now, Phil. Yeah, so, 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 so Bib, no, don't worry. So, so Bib Media, you know, it is... It's the service-based part of our business. So we have a lot of different revenue streams that come in, a lot of different angles that we work with. Um, I was saying to you off-air, you know, one of the newest revenue streams to the business is uh, major events. We're actually putting on events for some of these most you know, astute names across you know, personal development, and we're going to be bringing them over to Africa and, and, and bringing everybody together there to do some amazing things. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Africa, because I always get asked that question as mm-hmm. part of this. And I um, like the story that you told me off air about this. I was like, this is so fascinating and so just cool and wonderful. So do share, do share. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, 
please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. It's just it's just different, isn't it? I mean, it's so I I graduated with a surveying degree. I'd been in sport in the early part of my life, and, and there was kind of two sides to my life, if I'm honest. There was the educational side of my life, which was then going to lead into sort of real estate and surveying. And then there was the fact that I couldn't let go of the fact that I still wanted to be a football player, mm. um, soccer, soccer player for you. Um, I'd done really well all throughout my teens and played for some sort of major sides. And then I got medically retired because I kept fracturing my shin bone. And that was the end of that dream. And suddenly you very quickly have to grow up when you realize that Liverpool aren't going to call. That's not going to happen. You know, they might call me to let me know I left my wallet in the stadium, but that's as good as it's going to get. Still, I'm still waiting for that call for myself. So I don't want you to feel bad about that. No, do you know what? I don't because if that would have worked out for me, I probably never would have met my wife. I wouldn't have my daughters. So everything happens for a reason and when it's supposed to. That wasn't my path. So I, in a way, I'm glad it didn't happen because it wasn't supposed to happen. Exactly, exactly. Um, and if it had have happened, you know, my life would have been very different and, and maybe it would have been fun, but it certainly would have been, wouldn't have been fulfilled. I mean, could you imagine making a decision when you were, you know, many years ago, because I know how long you've been with your partner and, you, you know, many, many years ago, you two, you know, met and, and instead you decide, you know, actually, I'm not going to go to that college. I'm going to go to this one instead. Right. You, ne- you never meet him and that, ne- that relationship never happens. That friendship never happens. That childhood never happens. That happy home never happens because oh you made gosh. another decision. Taking you through a journey. Oh my! You know, God. So it's crazy, isn't it? So, so when you think of it that way, it, it, you know, you, I don't. I used to. I mean, when I was younger, I used to really begrudge. I mean, I was kind of in my twenties, drinking in a bar, like I could have been someone. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, this is horrific. I can't do this forever. Right. But I wasn't ready to let sport go. So. As you can tell, I like to talk. So I went into sports broadcasting, which I loved because it was just a great opportunity for me to talk about the thing that I love. And actually, because I played the game for a while, I had some pretty use- useful insights. And Fantastic combination of both. That's, that's great. It was, but it was so strange because my career was basically running two parallel lines that were n- not connected in any way, shape or form. Until podcasting happened because I started sports podcasting. I, I grew and sold a couple of those. And I thought, I wonder if I can do this for business because by this point, so I'll tell you how Africa happened. <laughs> That's how all this fits in, right? So I, I graduated with this surveying degree and uh, the global property market fell off a cliff. So I was a valuation surveyor at the time when nothing was being built. So Wow. You know, that's not great, especially considering, you know, everybody knows that you go to university, you do your qualification, and then you join the real world and have to learn how the job actually works. Mm-hmm. So I'd never done that. I had no idea how the job actually worked. What I'd done is I'd been a branch manager in a state agency, sort of a real estate brokers, putting myself through university. So I thought maybe I'll stay in that field for a bit, make some money. But I I ended up being offered this sort of three-month internship with the second largest property company in South Africa. And it was a a job in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And I recently met a girl on Twitter that I'd been talking to from Johannesburg. And I kind of thought, that's funny, because up until a couple of weeks ago, I'd never even heard of the place. Wow. Um, (laughs) So now I'm hearing about twice in the space of a couple of days. So I thought, well, this a go. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I went... The three-month contract turned into something far more senior. I ended up staying in Africa and, and ended up becoming a, a head of real estate for the continent for a massive property company down there. Um, lady on Twitter became my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, she came my wife very quickly. I think we got married about eight months after I met. After, I love after it. About, yeah, so it was very quick, very very quick. And it, when it's right, it's right. You know, this I never understood when you when you find something that fits and it's perfect. Why? Or why? Why delay? Why? I never understood. Like if you're waiting for something, it's like waiting for a bus and then it pulls up and you go, hmm, might sit here a bit longer. Right. I it's completely like, agree with you on that. It's I like, do. what are you doing? You get on the bus. You, you <laughs> <laughs> like There might not be another one. Just get on the bus. So uh, I loved it down there. And then I had something happen in my family, which was unfortunate back in the UK. And we had to move back here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really disappointed with that because I loved Africa. I love Africa. Um, 
my daughters are, are both mixed race. They're both dual nationality. Uh, you know, I'm very proud that they're, they're as much South African as they are British. Um, in fact, I think I prefer the South African part. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, I, I'm not going anything against the UK. It's my home. But it's like anything, isn't it? I mean, I know so many people from abroad that fantasize about London and the UK. And it's like, I lived there for four years and the place sucks. I don't want to go back. See, um, and this is where we differ. I so love London and oh no. I, I love just being there and and just everything about it was was such fun to me. And, and I'm I, always walking the wrong direction, the opposite direction to five thousand people, no matter where I go. This is it's true. like how how is there always a crowd going the other way? Like this <laughs> like why am I maybe this is a metaphor of my life. It's like why am I never going with the crowd? Why am I always going against it? That's so funny. But you know what? I think that's what that's what places us in the positions that we are today, right? Yeah, I agree. To- yeah, you have to take risks. You, you can't reap what you don't sow. It's the most simple phrase in the world, but it's so true. You know, he the only person that's never failed has never tried. Oh my gosh, Phil, you're in my brain again. So <laughs> I said the same thing the other day. And I think that when when one person says it, it's something notable, right? Yeah. When two people say it, it's, oh, okay. And then mm. when three and four and, you know, just tons of people who are aligned, you know, on the mission and have the goal of serving, right? Because to me, that's what servant leadership is. When people yep. believe something like that, right, that propels us forward. So I do think um, somebody asked me about regret the other day and I said, I have no regrets, you know, and they said, but, you know, you've done some things that have worked and some things that have not worked. And I'm like, of course, failure yeah, is part of the launching mission, right? I'm not going to know. And I will tell you, for me, it took me, I didn't learn to ride a bike until I was 12 years old. Um, yep. I kept crashing against this one particular gate. And so it was just, and I didn't have a bike, honestly, until I was, I think I got my first bike when I was 10 and it was my friend's old bike because we grew up, we didn't have a lot of money at all. So that yeah, was yeah. a luxury. And Absolutely. so by the time I got it, I was like, well, I have to ride this thing. And I kept falling and falling and falling. Mm. And then when I finally rode past that gate, I was so excited um, yep. that I did it that I fell again, but... <laughs> I learned how to ride the bike and then 100%. I loved it forever since then. So that I think it's important for us to try. It always is. You know, the, the way I see it is it, we are going to fall. It's going to happen, right? Tony Robbins says fall forward, for example. Mm. And, I, and I like that phrase because I think it, it show, there's a direction that you're heading in. Mm-hmm. What, what you can't keep doing is going out there, taking a step outside the door, realizing it's cold and running back inside. Right. Because you've moved no further forward. And actually, that was a complete waste of time because you've gone through that pain and then backed off. So you did it for yourself just to kind of feel some pain. Now, you might be into that kind of thing. I'm personally not. No, um, thank you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to have some pain just for some sort of enjoyment. I mean, if right. I'm going to have pain, I want to get something out of it. So every time I fail, it makes me more determined that we're going to succeed because every time we do something wrong, I go, okay, we've learned from that. We're mm-hmm. not going to do that again. And it's another step closer towards what we're trying to do. I'm, I'm never going to stay there. I'm not going to stay. Why would you stay in your down bit? Like, that's insane. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to sit down and rest here. This bit sucks. <laughs> but see, isn't that what, what people do when they have fear and they don't move? And I think we all have fear, but the difference is, you know, like you said about falling forward, what Tony Robbins had said, I, yeah. I think that it's about falling forward, but it's also about getting up. Right. Yes, um, many times as I fall, it's in the getting up that determines who I'm going to become. Right. Yep. And so if I'm fallen, if I've fallen and I'm stuck in that place and I don't get up, I think it's because the fear I've let it overtake me. And mm. I, I tell people it's the same thing with happiness. Right. Happiness is a choice. Um, and it's the harder choice, right? Um, people say to me all the time, you're always in such a good mood. And I'm like, well, that's not true, but it's about yes. what I can control and what I can't control. And so if I can, you know, I can control my reaction to things. Yes. Right? And that's that's about controlling our falls, right? I can control my falling forward. I can decide, okay, this didn't work. How am I going to pivot, right? Mm. And I I feel like that is what sets people apart from who is quote unquote successful because success looks different to everyone, right? Mm, Um, But like who's successful in their lives? And for me, that looks like joy, happiness, family, right? The same resonates with you. And so I think it's really important that when we have that, 
we remember what that is and, and we want that for other people. So I think that's where the servant leadership in you comes in. Like, that's what I always feel when I have a conversation with you. And I feel like that's what helps you be so successful is that you want to shine that light on others. And I think that's why the light is also being shown upon you. Do you know, it's a lovely thing for you to say. And actually one of the things that I think is, um, it has been really nice is that these people, you know, again, I include you in this, these people who I admire and I aspire, and I think they're doing some really incredible things are, are paying me compliments. And this actually came about because of a really significant change. It was a quick change, but it was a very significant change. Um, I had a real anger problem, a serious anger problem. I had a very short fuse. I was always eight, nine out of 10 at all times. I was ready to erupt. Um, I couldn't imagine that now. I couldn't. To, well, no, to the point where my friends used to think it was funny to prod me just to see how far I'd react because they knew how quickly they could do it. Like if they were bored, they'd just do something to annoy me. And Oh, they're it, awful. <laughs> it, could, it could be just as something as simple as sitting next to me. Like I'm in the middle of two people. I remember this specifically. We're in the back of a car middle of these two people and this guy goes so you know who my favorite player is it's this guy i just think he's amazing and it was somebody (laughs) who i really disliked and i just sat there for about three seconds and started shouting and and the two guys either side of me just burst out laughing going you're right he managed about three seconds oh wow Um, and i was like okay now i need to change but needing to change is hard because if you have no idea how to change it's just something you're saying to yourself Mm -hmm. and what i realized was i was doing this all wrong Mm. Um, you can't think with your head. You can't trust your head <laughs> because half the stuff that's in your head isn't even yours. Mm. It's programming that was given to you as a child. You know, money doesn't grow on trees. Yes, it does. It's paper. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't have everything you want. Yes, you can just earn enough. I mean, like all the stuff we were told just simply isn't true. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not because our parents didn't love us. It's not because they wanted what was bad for us. It's because they taught us what they were taught. And if they didn't exactly. know how can you expect them to tell you something they didn't know? If they knew, they'd have been living a different life themselves and they would have been showing you. Mm -hmm. So it's not their fault. And then I think that's a hard realization because there's actually a lot of comfort in your bad habits. You know, it was much easier to lose my temper than it was to learn. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. of course it was. was. I could just fly off the handle and that was what everybody expected of me. And then I got to the point where I started trying to think. Somebody said something to me. It was really profound. And they said, any situation that starts to stress me out, and I'll explain why this person was important. They were one of my first mentors, self-made multimillionaire. And they were the first person that was really honest with me about, it's not all rah, rah, rah. We're not happy 100% of the time. We have the same rubbish to deal with that you do. We just have different coping mechanisms. And I love that because I always thought, I'll be like them when I also have a life that's completely stress-free and it doesn't work like that. Like that that life doesn't exist. Um, You know, more money, more problems, right? I'm not going to sing or anything, but it's, it's, it's so true. Um, Feel free to break out in song. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's that's another show. (laughs) We'll do do that for an evening show. We're like a karaoke special. Um, But he said to me, look, anytime I ask myself, I'm getting stressed about a situation. I say to myself, in 30 days time, is this going to be important? And if the answer is no, I instantly let it lose its power. If the answer is yes, then I start to look at how seriously and quickly we can change that. So it's not an issue in 30 days. Wow. And I was That's like, awful. okay, so how does that work? So I started thinking about it. And every time I started losing my temper from that point, or I'd feel it coming. I'd go, is this going to bug me in 30 days? And I'd go, I'm not even going to remember what this was in 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So the answer is probably no. So I. I started laughing instead, as you can hear. So I laugh now. And sometimes that can rub people up the wrong way, because especially if they're trying to annoy me and I laugh, that that can sometimes rub people up the wrong way. But it's just my coping mechanism, because I register what's going on. And I'm not laughing at them. I'm laughing at my body's natural reaction is still to go. And then I laugh at that now and go, okay, well, that's funny. But I'm not going to lose my temper (laughs) because it's not worth it. It's not, it's not. And I completely, I can relate to that. Not insofar as, you know, flying off the handle, but I have, I have this, I don't want to say gift for gab, but 
Um, ever since I was little, I remember getting in trouble in school because um, I'd be speaking, right? I'd be talking. And mm-hmm. I remember um, I said to my teachers all the time, I wasn't talking, I was answering, right? Yep. I just happened to be the one that, get, that got caught. And then later on, I realized, you know, what I'd been chastised so much for ended up becoming a career. First interpreting, then public speaking, then podcasting. And I was just like, wow, you know, I, I, and it goes back to what you were saying about um, just how people are programmed to believe certain things, right? Because a part of this this, um, show, part of the Global Fluency podcast um, explores every aspect of diversity. And and part of that Mm -hmm. is diversity of thought, right? Um, Because race and nationality and ethnicity, that's all very important as well. But I, like we were talking about off air initially, um, this show um, talks about every aspect of diversity. And I think diversity of thought is not visited enough, right? That's why I love getting thought leaders such as yourself to come here and just exchange these ideas because those coping mechanisms that we do develop, mm-hmm. we are fighting the nature we've been programmed to have. See, but, see, but if, if I may just interject, you say that we develop, we didn't develop them. Somebody else developed them for them. We just accepted yeah. them. And the fact that we accepted them shows that we can reject them as well. Absolutely. But the thing is, you, it's hard to reject something without replacing it because then we feel empty and we feel confused and we don't know what to fill it with. Mm-hmm. So my argument is often it's not about emptying the stuff that's in your head. It's about replacing it with things that better suit you now. So you're never going to replace those things. You mm-hmm. can just take the power away from them. And instead, you, your programming can now tell you something else. Your programming can tell you, you know, I don't like the word luck, for example, but you know, your program can tell that you're a very fortunate person and you only need one raffle ticket in that raffle. It doesn't matter if everyone else has 100 each, you're still got a better chance of winning than every single one of them because it's you. Right. And if you truly believe that, that's going to happen. And it's, you know, people listen to that and they go, what? They, well, do you know what? We always say this on the network. It's not my job to convince you. you this either resonates with you and you come with us or it doesn't. And I wish you well on your journey. And, and th- that's it. And you know what? We were, think, we were talking about um, off air about The Secret for a moment, right? Yeah. One of the, I'm a huge fan of The Secret. And Me too. I remember thinking to myself when I was listening to it, I was going on a long drive. And so, and this drive was like six hours and I was listening to it on an audio um, book. Yes. And the, there was a gentleman, I forget which one mentioned, you know, this, this segment about luck and thinking about a parking spot and how if you believe you'll find a parking spot all the time, you will find a parking spot all the time. That to me was a huge shift, right? Because the, the analogy was simple enough. And then I started to say that to myself, you know, oh, I'm going to always find a parking spot. And you know what? I always ended up finding a parking spot. And even the other day, I was um, participating in a webinar and um, I just, you know, they were having a contest on it, you know, just to keep us motivated. And they were saying, okay, whoever, um, we're pulling out names. And so um, this person is going to win a t-shirt. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was such a fun thing to do. And so I said to myself, I'm going to win a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. And there were tons of people on the webinar. And you know what? They called my name. I won Love the t-shirt. It. I was grateful, but I was not surprised. No. Right? Well, do you know what? The, the problem is it also works the other way. So if there's any of your listeners listening to this right now thinking, how could you have possibly have like just won that t-shirt or got that parking space? It's luck. It's chance. It's random. It's Okay. Well, I'll give you another example then because we've all had this one. I promise you. Mm-hmm. We wake up in the morning and everything just goes wrong. You burn or drop your toast. Uh, you stir in the coffee and you're not paying attention. It goes all over the counter and starts dripping onto your bare foot. Shower's cold. Uh, you know, it's, you, you, you get dressed, you open the door. Drain in. Oh, great. And then what do, what do people say in that situation? They go, oh, this day is going to be so crap. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens? Does anybody ever have a good day from that point? No, because you just told the world that the day is going to be crap. So Absolutely. you Absolutely. reap what you sow. Whereas if you say, well, that was an interesting morning. The good news is it gets better from here. Guess what happens? Absolutely. And you know what? That is a real thing because I've done that myself, right? We all have. We all, Every single one of us. And that's why I love it as an example because mm-hmm. the positive stuff, sometimes you know, if you're in a dark place or you're feeling quite low or you're not feeling yourself or you're feeling sad or depressed, which, which let's be honest, during lockdown, a lot of people have been feeling really difficult emotions, a lot of anxiety. Absolutely. Um, it's hard to remain positive from a point of anxiety. So if you can't 
rationalize it to yourself by thinking about the positive. Think about how it works with the negative and try and avoid doing it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So now I'm going to shift us a little Mm. to cultural confidence, right? Because your journey has been one of inclusion. It's been one of diversity. It's been one Mm -hmm. of evolution, right? Uh, Personally and professionally. So I want to ask you, so with regard to cultural competence, what clear goals has this helped you establish in your podcasting journey and work, particularly with your work um, in Africa? Like what clear goals has this helped you establish? Good question. I think I think the clearest thing that all of the traveling helped me to establish was that we're all the same. And that actually, you know, if you just treat people with respect, I mean, yes, there are cultural differences, but I love learning about them. And actually, this one, we, we've had this conversation off air as well. It's one of the reasons I seriously dislike political correctness, because I think it's, it's hampering the relationship and, and, and the learning of cultural diversity. Because... I was fortunate enough, maybe because of my ignorance, who knows, but I was fortunate enough that I could just ask somebody the, the, the silly question or the, why do you wear that? Or why do you do that? Or how come you have to pray five times a day? Or why don't you eat pork? Or do you not want a beer? How can you not want a beer? You know, it's <laughs> all of those things are like, what do you mean you don't eat cow? I mean, if you like, never tried steak, like you need peppercorn sauce and all that really <laughs> ignorant stuff, you know, but I've made some of the most wonderful friends. You know, I, my wife is South African Indian, so she's she's ticking two boxes there. Mm-hmm. Um, my my children are a mix of of me and obviously of my wife, and and I've got most of Europe plus loads of Ireland and four centuries of Scouse Liverpudlian in my blood. So my children have probably one of the most interesting <laughs> mixes in the world, um, and I love that. I absolutely love, and I love that they have so many different cultures to explore and so many different types of you know foods to eat, places to go, people to see, people that they can relate to. Mm-hmm. Because one of the hardest things about growing up where I did was I didn't relate to, to people um, mm-hmm. that I was around. So I, I'll give you an example. I felt like I was trapped somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. I used to use that example a lot wow. because I'd say, I don't feel as Americanized as Americans. They're like a bit too rah, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm not the introvert Brit. I'm the loud, outgoing, bashful one that they say, you'd enjoy America. (laughs) Um, And I was like, well, where am I supposed to be? Because this doesn't fit. And then I thought, well, and at that time, let's be honest, we we basically, at this age, were just looking across the channel. I was thinking, well, maybe I'll go to the States then. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up going the other way entirely. And because of the footballing career, I ended up going out to Hungary to do some playing originally and then some coaching out there. And I was coaching at football academies where the ki- some kids spoke broken English, most kids spoke no English. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with them. And I fell in love with the culture. And I fell in love with Budapest as a, as a place. And I remember standing in a museum, you know, and I don't mind admitting this, I remember standing in a museum in uh, Budapest reading about what had happened to it during World War II and how it had been really hurt and the city had been destroyed and, you know, millions of people were taken off to concentration camps. And I just remember standing there crying that this beautiful place that I love so much Mm -hmm. had been through so much pain. And I remember thinking at the time, like, how can I feel so much emotion for a country that's not even mine? Like, how can I feel so much, like, love for a a people that just aren't, they're nothing to do with me. Like, they're not, they're not my people. So the way that we were brought up is, you know, your nation first. And even before that, you know, in the States, it's more sort of state by state behaves in a certain way. You know, in the UK, it's city by city. You know, the biggest rivalry in football, in world football, in world soccer is Liverpool, Manchester United. I was just thinking about those two cities. Well, what most people don't know is that they're 30 minutes apart. Wow. I mean, I live in a place at the moment that is smack bang in the middle of both. I could get to Old Trafford and Anfield in 15 minutes from here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, this is the biggest rivalry in sport and they are just on each other's doorsteps. Mm-hmm. And we speak differently and we behave differently and we have different morals and we have, you know, it, it, it's completely different. And you start to think, well, how can anybody ever relate with foreigners? We can't even relate with each other, mm-hmm. you know? And then you've got the North South divide where Northerners don't like people in London and people in London don't like Northerners. They think we're all <laughs> bonkers. Not, north of the Watford Gap, you know, the oxygen gets thinner or something and we all just get a little bit crazy. Um, I don't know what they think actually, (laughs) hopefully not that. Um, But 
you know, you think to yourself, well, there's no way we're ever going to be able to get on with foreigners. That's that's and that's that's how nationalism happens because people start going, well, that's the problem. That's why we don't get on with each other. It's always foreigners coming here and messing up the culture part. And I'm thinking, you're mad. Like we dislike. Look at the history books. We disliked each other a long time before the foreigners were here. Absolutely, absolutely. It's you know what I I will say I liken that to what is going on in the United States right now. Um, I'm a lover of political science. I'm an adjunct professor of political science. Mm -hmm. And that's just always been a love of mine. It's what I went to school for. Um, And so what what I see happening with regard to what you said about political correctness, Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. It's, I think it's the enemy of cultural competence because it's not lending to accuracy, right? It's not letting us use accurate terminology. And so I think a part of what, what it's easy to do is create an other, Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of us dealing with our immediate issues amongst ourselves. Right. So I I liken this to instead of Liverpool and Manchester having a seat and saying, "Okay, this is our issue with one another. Let's blame the other. Right. Let's blame the other. Meanwhile, the other is starting to change the face of the country. Right. The other is becoming the country. Yes. Right. And so now we're all in this boat together. And the same thing happens here in the United States. And I think because of the sheer size of the U.S. and, and that we have, you know, all of these states, what that tends to do is, is you know, create a more chaotic environment simply yeah. because one state's not doing what the other state's doing. And you can see this happening now with COVID-19. Yep. Um, different states there are different rules. And so, you know, if you apply this to to a time even before the pandemic, you would see, I'll use, for instance, the right to marry. Um, You would see that not every state allowed gay people to marry, right? Mm. So first you've got a spouse, then you go on a road trip to visit your family, and now you're not married anymore. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I thought to myself, the, the inequity... And and honestly, the utter lunacy of it all, you yeah. know, you're not seeing the forest for the trees, you know, because if you're married, you're married, be married, 100%. right? And so I think that's when we tend to kind of lose sight of what truly is important. So I love that you say that, you know, you felt this, this kinship with a people that were not your own. And I think that that has a lot to do with compassion and empathy, right? Mm. Um, because you're recognizing suffering, right? And so you're acknowledging that suffering. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with how we interact with others, um, how we perceive ourselves as well, you know? And to me, that is where um, an inclusive experience begins. Because I say diversity is great, right? It's great to mm. have faces in the audience. But if they're not each partaking of the experience in the same way, then then it doesn't matter. See, that, that's it. And I think you can't experience a culture until you're included in it. You can't study it from a book. It's not it's not something that you can download off the internet and see what somebody's culture is like. You have to live it. And, and a great example I could give you for that is that I married into, a, as I said, my wife's South African Indian, but she's mm-hmm. she's from a Muslim family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're not supposed to marry outside religion. In fact, I'm, I was raised Catholic and neither, neither are we. I mean, mm-hmm. I I would not call myself a Catholic anymore by any stretch of imagination, but that was the way I was raised. And that was part of my, my core beliefs as I thought they were. Um, and you know, we we were very different, very different. I was the first white person to marry into that family. Um, you know, she has a large family, lots of aunties, uncles, cousins, all this kind of stuff. And they're all very close. Mm -hmm. And that for me was quite unusual because I, I wasn't used to that whole, uh, you know, the African lifestyle with family where everyone comes together to eat and it's all just like a, everyone's welcome. You know, it doesn't matter whether the cousins are coming or, you know, you, you don't have to make an invite, you just show up. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you're showing up on an ounce, bring something with you. Yes, <laughs> you, you know? and, 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 and I love that because it's, it's, you know, you could have, you know, work, you come home and now there's 18 people around the house and it's full yeah. of energy, full of love and, and, and I adored it. But one of the things that you get to experience when you're included in that was, I never knew this before. Every time you visit an Indian household, they try and feed you. Yeah. It's like a it's like a thing. <laughs> so when you're visiting like my wife's hometown, for example, and we're only there for a couple of days, so we have to visit like six, seven people in a day. I mean, I say mm-hmm. have to. We want to. I'd mm-hmm. love to visit more. Um 
but we go and, and everyone's like, oh, please just have some roti and have some this. And oh, I've made you some biscuits. Oh, you must. I've just made them for you. And it's to. like, if only you knew that I've had like eight lunches so far and it's two, um, two o'clock and I'm going to burst and oh, that looks delicious. But I really, okay, I'll just a little slice. <laughs> right. Um, I, I totally understand that. I but totally you, understand But that. you don't know that until you're immersed in the culture and you don't know that that's a hospitality thing and you and you don't know that the reason that there's a, a curry uh, sort of dish in southern africa called bunny chow which is basically a loaf of bread that's hollowed out and you put the curry inside it and it's mm-hmm. absolutely delicious what i didn't know was that was because it was used as a lunch box to keep people's food warm when they used to walk so they put the the curry or the chow inside the wow. inside the bread and they put the lid back on and then they'd use the bread to eat it so they wouldn't have cutlery so they'd use it in the fields and they'd use their hands and they'd just dig in and get the bread and eat and it's delicious and i'd ate it lots of times and had absolutely no idea why it did that um and again i mean you you talked about relating to the emotion of a place and seeing its pain Africa has so much love and happiness and so much pain. And it's, it's almost too emotional to try and think about it all because it's hard to separate them as well. Because whilst there are so many joyous things going on and so many incredible things, you also know that there are some people having some horrible struggles and some really difficult times. Absolutely. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about what we do with Africa is that I, I talk about introducing the best of Africa to the world and the best of the world to Africa. Mm-hmm. And the reason I want to do that is that Africa has a lot of problems, but yet now with connectivity getting better, telecoms connectivity, you know, villages that were off the grid two years ago now have 60 meg fiber optic lines, you know, life and business is going to change. And they say, that necessity is the mother of invention. Well, not criticizing the States because it's the same here in the UK. You know, if our food's not here in 30 minutes that we ordered from the phone in the palm of our hand, we get a discount. You know, we can, we can get shopping delivered to our house same day. If Amazon turn up too late, you're furious that they've taken four hours to bring you this thing you've only just purchased. Isn't that you know, insane, though? I mean, from just a global perspective, that's kind of crazy. This is mental. It, it, and it's, it, it's, it's made us entitled. And it's made us lazy. But Africa still has problems. Africa has lots of problems that require solutions. And now the technological capability to be able to solve those problems. So I don't think it's a, an overstatement to say that the most innovative technological advancements over the next decade will come out of Africa, undoubtedly. I am wholeheartedly in agreement with you on that. I do think that the world, and and it's so funny, I feel like, again, you're peeking into my brain, the world (laughs) has so much to learn from Africa. And rather than, you know, as a continent and as individual countries, right? Rather than, you know, thinking of Africa, I think the the world, particularly the United States, I'll say, and and parts of the UK, um, just... Just thinking, and I don't want to put Bono out there, but (laughs) I love Bono, but he has a paternalistic approach Mm -hmm. to, you know, problem solving in Africa. And and I say this as somebody who, you know, the child of immigrants, my parents are from Haiti, and I see, I've, I've been to Haiti, I've lived in Haiti. And I see, you know, the beauty of the country. I love going there. I miss it deeply, especially because I can't go there now, you know. Um, And so, but I also see the problems that exist. But I also see when, you know, places, um, organizations come in who try to do good, but rather um, than empower, they enable and mm. in the country economically, it, it really ruins what can be a very prosperous country once again. And yeah, they, they just put, I mean, without trying to pick on them, China, for example, owns a lot of Africa as infrastructure yes. and that kind of stuff. And and whilst I appreciate that the cash flow was useful to come into the business and they, sorry, the country and they needed power plants and all that kind of stuff. I agree with you. You know, they've sold them the fish. They've not taught them how to fish. Um, and, and, and I think that's a real, a real shame. Um, and you know, one of the things I'd love is I have a number of, of African American friends who, when I talk to them about Africa, it's, there's almost like a longing for a place and they don't even know where it is. Yeah. Um, I have to say that is a source of contention, yeah. at least here in the States, um, among black people and African Well, there's, the, the records are horrific. So how are you ever going to trace back where's home? You know, you can do ancestry DNA and that kind of stuff and hope to work it out. But we, I, I don't mean to, to be sound presumptive and, and say that I, I'm going to fix that situation. 
I, Lord knows I'd love to. I just, I don't know whether I have the power, but I tell you one thing I'd love to do. And it's one of the things that my, my African-American friends have said to me, and I hope it works for so many other people, is that by introducing them to businesses and people and mentors from across Africa as well, as, as I said, it's introducing the world to the best of Africa and vice versa. Mm-hmm. They're getting to experience different cultures and different people, and they're getting that inclusive feeling. And, and I, I hope that people find what I did and they find the place that resonates with them. So, so I have no qualms about saying that Cape Town and South Africa in general is my spiritual home. I love that place with all my heart. Um, it's the, I close my eyes and it's the place I dream about. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not ashamed to say that. And, and I, I feel so passionately about so much of Africa. And even when I'm anywhere else in Africa, I want to go home. And home isn't the UK. Home yeah. is Cape Town. Home is South Africa. Home is back. It's home. It's like, it doesn't even need an introduction. It's just home. Well, that's because that's where your heart is, right? Absolutely. And I, and I really want other people to find that. You know, I really want, especially because I know what it likes to feel lost. You know, I, I felt lost in somewhere that was my home. I didn't feel British in England. It was a weird feeling. I didn't feel at all attached to my own nation. And if there's other people feeling that and experiencing that, then I hope even in just some small part that they take some enjoyment or that they have a good feeling that resonates with them about a place and then they go and explore it some more and and they find where their heart is. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, then that brings us to our last question then. What is something that you'd like to impart upon our listeners? But I feel like that was it, right? That's it. Well, do you know what? For for all of our listeners, I would say, anybody who's listening to the show, I, I would ask you to remember that the thoughts that go on in your head, negative and positive, Mm-hmm. they're often not yours. Mm-hmm. So start using your heart to make decisions more than your head because your head can't be trusted. Wow. That is fantastic. Bill, thank you so much for this conversation, for you taking the time to join us and our audience. I really, I could talk to you for hours. And Likewise. One, I love it. I know it's it's the best. And, and one thing I, I want to say to our listeners too, um, because, you know, they're hearing this because it's podcast, they're not seeing us right now, mm-hmm. uh, but you can see us on Billionaires in Boxers. You can indeed. I'm going to yeah. be on Billionaires in Boxers. The content will all be there. If you haven't found us before, there's two ways you can find us. Mm-hmm. Either search for my name, Philip Pelucha, which is P-E-L-U-C-H-A. There's only one of me in the world, so you should find me pretty easily. Failing that, make your way over to billionairesinboxers.com. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm, I'm, I want you guys to follow Phil really and truly. Um, I think you're just going to love what he's doing, what he's discussing. It's a wonderful place um, for you to be. And especially if, you know, if you're a thought leader, if you want to become a thought leader, this is how you do it. You expand your horizons, you expand your network, and really you expand what is being offered out there. So you can, well, you expand your knowledge, and this is really a great way to do it. And so, you know, one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, if you saw Phil and I, we don't look the same. We're different races, we're different genders. And yet, um, so much of our stories are aligned. We're both Catholics, (laughs) uh, right? Race Catholic. We're both, you know, passionate about not only creating content, but sharing information, right? Mm -hmm. We both believe in servant leadership. We both have really awesome love stories with our partners, right? Um, We're both raising kids. Um, My husband is not Haitian. So, you know, um, he happens to be from Jamaica, but we are very culturally different. Yeah, I can believe it. And day. And so, you know, I I really want people to see that um, diversity comes in many forms. Yes, it does. But inclusion also comes in many forms. So your, your tribe, your network, your people may not look like you, but you may be very, very similar to people that, you know, you don't even live near. So 100%. I would say, you know, if, if I may, just, okay. just on that note, because I, I love what you've just said. So if, if I may, there's, this is the best time to realize that, isn't it? Because we're all in lockdown, or at least we've all been in lockdown of some degree at some point. You know, we've missed loved ones' birthdays. We've missed giving people a hug. We've missed socializing. We've missed exercising. We've missed going, you know, doing the things that we want to do we've missed people, we've missed traveling, we, we've all had the same experience. And one good way to look at it is, you know, think about this, everybody from every race that you can possibly think of has missed a loved one, missed a birthday, missed a special event during this time. And we all dealt with it the same way. We FaceTimed each other, we WhatsApped each other, we laughed, we cried, we watched movies, we baked homemade food. 
and we did stuff that we haven't done since we were kids. And if this doesn't show us that it really doesn't matter, the body, the vehicle that you're driving around in, that is not you. We are all the same on a spiritual level. That's just the vessel you're driving around in. And if, if, if you don't see that now, I, I really hope that something less dramatic as COVID-19 wakes you up. Totally, totally. And I couldn't think of a better note for us to end on. So thank you once again, Phil Palucha, for joining us on the Global Fluency Podcast. And for all of our listeners out there, remember, let's keep the conversation going. Take this conversation and have it at your virtual water coolers. Discuss it with your friends. Um, Let us know what you're thinking. And you can always find us on the Global Fluency Podcast on Facebook. And you can also find us for closed captioning on YouTube. So once again, Phil, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So tune in everyone next time to the Global Fluency Podcast. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.